of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ there's no doubt that jesus said unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse number 5. But what about when a person obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian? After baptism, then what? That's what we're going to discuss today in our study. We encourage you to get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to think about this wonderful subject together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855. 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. Friend, it is absolutely right and biblical to stress the essentiality of baptism because the Scripture does. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38 The Lord said, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. Paul said we're baptized into Christ. Peter said baptism does now save us, Romans 6, 1 through 4, 1 Peter 3, 21. A multitude of scriptures teach the absolute essentiality of baptism. And we, we stress the essentiality of it. We teach people that's what you've got to do. But have we prepared ourselves to tell somebody now that you've accepted that, now that you have obeyed the gospel and become a Christian, Here's what's necessary after baptism. A new babe in Christ shouldn't be left just to fend them for themselves. We've got to help them understand after baptism, now what's expected? You told all this about the plan of salvation, about baptism, how to get in the church. That's wonderful. I've obeyed the gospel. Now what? And so today we consider after baptism, now what? Number one. After you obey the gospel, after you become a child of God, have submitted to God's teaching concerning salvation, never, ever stop growing. After you've been baptized, never stop growing. There is no retirement plan in the church. There is no retirement age. There isn't a point where you can say, I've done enough, I'm going to sit back and take it easy. The Christian goal is to grow continually as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior first Peter chapter 2 verse 2 and second Peter chapter 3 verse 19 uh, the, the writer of the book of Kings said in second Kings 1930 take root downward and bear fruit upward that's what we're to do. We're to be rooted in the truth and bear spiritual fruit 
to Almighty God, according to John chapter 15. You know, when we think about this idea of growing, sometimes it's sad that people obey the gospel, are baptized for mission of sins, and their starting point was their stopping point. That happened in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning about verse number 12, Paul said, or the Hebrew writer said, By this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles the oracles of God. You've come to need milk, not solid food. They had obeyed the gospel. They become Christians, but they just kind of sat down and didn't grow. Paul says, you need to get up. Hebrew writer says, you need to get up. You need to grow. You need to be taught again, thus implying that a Christian should never ever stop growing. What can I grow in? I can grow in love. Hebrews 13 1, let brotherly love continue. John chapter 13 verse 34 and 35, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you should also love one another. I can grow in my love for, as a new Christian, for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. Mark chapter 12, verse number 30. I can grow in love for others. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 following. I can grow in my love for, for Christ by having the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, verse 5. By walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, verse number 21. And I can grow in my love for the Lord's church. Acts 20 verse 28, Paul said to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. It is that beautiful bride of Christ, Ephesians 5 28, and it is that kingdom and that family which is going to be received by the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 24. I need to grow in my love of the Word of God. And so, friend, there's a multitude of things one could grow in, and, and the list today could go on and on, but the basic point is you've got to never, ever stop growing as a Christian. Read your Bible. Uh, pray to God every day. Do the things that are necessary to spiritually reach toward that goal of heaven itself. Secondly, as a child of God, after baptism, what can you do? Make a determination that you will always be faithful to the Lord. You see, to be pleasing to God, I've got to live faithful all the days of my life. Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, then I'll give you the crown of life. Matthew 7 21, it's not just everybody that looks up into the sky or everybody that just mouths the words, Lord, Lord, it's going to go to heaven, but he who does, and that word is continual, he who does the will of my Father in heaven, Jesus said to the Jews, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And so when we talk about being faithful, we're talking about really what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It is a daily desire. Every day I'm going to do my best to be faithful to the Lord. Now, let's mention some specific areas that we want to determine to be faithful in. I want to determine that I'm going to be faithful in studying my Bible every day. Study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Scriptures daily. Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. We want to do what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, Be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. And we want to hide God's Word in our heart. Your Word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. I love the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, verse number 6. Jesus said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And here's the example of that in Scripture. Jeremiah said, Your words were found and I did eat them. There's that hungering. I did eat them. And they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Jeremiah 15, verse number 16. And so when I make a determination, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to always be faithful. I'm making a determination to faithfully study my Bible every day. I'm making a determination I'm going to be faithful to God in prayer. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Who wouldn't want to go to the throne of grace? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16, and speaking of that help, James says in James 5.16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. We want to do as Jesus said in Luke 18.1, men ought to pray always and never lose heart. Follow the example of Christ in Mark 1 verse 35 where in the morning, a great while before daylight, Jesus went out to a solitary place and there prayed. He got away from the rat race of life, got by himself and started every day in prayer to God. But you know, friend, as we think about making a determination to be faithful, now that you've obeyed the gospel and become a Christian, we want to determine to be faithful in evangelism. Grow so that you can tell somebody else about God's saving plan of salvation. Jesus in Matthew 9, as He's teaching the people, He looked out across on the multitudes and He said these words, Truly, the harvest is plentiful, but there's a problem. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of harvest that He'll send out laborers into His harvest. Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38. Those laborers are me and you. We've been commissioned to go into all the world and take the gospel unto every creature. But friend, as we think about making that determination to grow and to always be faithful, let's realize this as well. One of the things I need to do after baptism, and this is always a challenge, I need to learn to shun evil companions and evil places. The Bible teaches Christians ought to shun the ungodly. I'm not saying we live in a closet. I'm not saying we live on an island by ourselves. But we're saying that you don't want to bring those people into the influence circle in your life. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 33. The Bible says a very powerful statement here. Evil companions corrupt good morals. If you run with people of the world who are evil, and those are your closest friends, your closest acquaintances, those who you spend the most time with, it's very likely the case that that can rub off on you. And so let's realize I've got to shun evil companions. Maybe before you became a child of God, you had friends who were not the best friends who said things, who did things, who were involved in things that are not right. Friend, although we may have an emotional attachment to them, let's realize if they're going to lead me down the wrong path, I can't be their friend anymore. You've got to beware of worldly-minded friends who can bring you down. Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a threat to Lot and his family, and it vexed his righteous soul. And God eventually said, I want you to get out of the city. Get away from that. It's doing you more harm than good. Uh, think about Balaam over and over again. He resisted, but finally, because of the pressure and the temptation and the immorality, Balaam succumbed to the temptation to curse God's people. And so here's some things that you've got to be careful about. Don't let evil acquaintances talk you into doing things you know you ought not to do. You've got to shun the immorality of this world. God says in Hebrews 13 verse 4, Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. But don't run with people who are going to be involved in immorality of any type, whether it be sexual or whatever it may be. Don't run with people who are involved in things like uh, drugs and alcohol. The Bible says wine's a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever's led astray by it is not wise. Don't consume yourself or be so close with people who are always using filthy language and talk. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29 says, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. You know, if I'm around people who talk dirty and use dirty language and I may have had a problem with that in the past, it's going to be so hard for that not to be entering in my mind all the time and me thinking about it. You've got to learn. I can't be around people like that anymore. Don't let ungodly companions rub off on you. Learn after baptism. I'm going to shun those type of people. Then, friend, we suggest that after baptism, you've got to learn to avoid 
questionable places. Not just the people, but the environment as well can sometimes wreak havoc on a new Christian's life if they're not careful. Friend, the Bible teaches that we are not to be friends with the world or the worldly. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18, the scripture says, Come out from among them, listen now, and be ye separate, says the Lord. I'll be your God, you shall be my people. And it's probably some of the strongest language in scripture. The half-brother of the Lord, James says in James 4, verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. God says in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, Do not love the world or all that is in the world. Lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the evil one, and the world and all that's in it is passing away. Friend, I've got to learn. This old world and the people who are friends with the world, we're talking about sin, we're talking about immorality, we're talking about letting Satan rule their lives. This world and the people of it like that. I cannot let them affect my life. We've got to draw, you know, you've got to draw a line somewhere. The old saying is, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for everything. And how true that is. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, let me mention some places specifically you're going to need to be careful about. You've got to be careful. Avoid these places at all costs. Don't find yourself in the gambling casinos. No good's going to come from that. The immorality, the ungodliness, the immodesty, the liquor, the, the greed that's there. If I'm going to grow as a Christian after baptism, I'm sure not going to do it in a place like that. Be careful about places that where immodesty is running rampant. And friend, I understand you can't walk out of your house without seeing some type of immodesty. But places that I know people are going to be dressed immodestly in every scenario, I need to learn to avoid those places. I need to learn to avoid places where language is going to be used, where filthy music is going to be heard, where liquor and alcohol are going to be served, where the people of the world are going to have a chance to impact my life. I need to learn to avoid places where ungodly scenes have the potential to flood my mind, whether it be the movie place or whether it be a theater or whatever it may be. I've got to learn as a Christian there are some places now that I just can't go, that aren't going to help me to grow spiritually. What else can I do after baptism that will help me as a child of God? Friend, learn early. Let it be impressed upon your mind from the very early stages of Christianity. After baptism, I need to attend all the services of the Lord's church. The Bible clearly teaches in Hebrews 10 verse 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's a clear teaching. Here's a command of God. Don't forsake the assembly. When Christians come together as a group of people to worship God, I need to learn after baptism, I need to be there. No matter what, I want to make it my goal every time. Unless I'm sick, or I can, I'm hindered from doing that in some way, I need to absolutely be there. And friend, it's not just a need. It ought to be a want for every child of God. David said it this way, and this ought to be every Christian's attitude. Try to make this your attitude. I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122 verse 1. Don't see it as a grudge. Don't begrudge it. Don't see it as something, if I don't do this, I'm going to go to hell. Don't see it as something that you know you have to check off the checklist. Be glad to be able to worship the Lord. Think about the things you get to do. When I attend the worship service of the Lord, I get to worship Almighty God who's done so much for me. We bow down, we honor Him, we praise His name, we worship Him in spirit and truth. What can I do for God who's done so much for me? God's asked us to worship Him in spirit and truth. When I attend with the saints, I have the privilege of observing the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 verse 7, we do that on the first day of the week. And according to 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30, we do that in memory of Christ until He comes. I have a privilege and an opportunity to think about, to pay honor to, to worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in, a, in memory of everything He did for me. We have the opportunity to sing. 
songs of praise to God. We have the opportunity to come together as a group of Christians and, and pray and encourage one another. We have the opportunity, and it is a privilege. We have the opportunity and the privilege to have the Word of God preached and hopefully to have our hearts pricked by that message to motivate us, to challenge us, to change us, to do what God wants us to do in this life. And so, as a new Christian, make it a goal. I'm going to put God first, Matthew 6, 33. I'm going to be at worship no matter what, unless I'm sick and I'm on my deathbed and I can't be there. I'm going to be at worship at every opportunity to honor God, to praise Him, and to do the things that God wants me to do. What else can you do as a new Christian? Friend, after baptism, we encourage you, have an earnest longing to go home and be with God. Friend, that ought to be every Christian's expectation. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, he said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in between a rock and a hard place in essence. I'm hard pressed between the two. What are the two? A desire to go home and be with God, which is far better. But he says, I also want to stay here with you, which is needful for the time. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We want to have that mindset. I really want to go home and be with God. Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present day not even worthy be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do we realize how wonderful heaven's going to be? There'll be no more sorrow, death, crying, pain, all the former things have passed away. You know, the two greatest things about heaven are God will be there and Satan won't. Now, who doesn't want to go to a place like that? Our Father who art in heaven, Matthew 6, verse 9. The devil is cast out into hell into the everlasting darkness. God will be there, Satan won't, and all the troubles and tribulations of this life cease to exist. Don't you want to go to a place like that? If so, in the words of Paul, we want to be further clothed with that immortality and that beautiful, incorruptible state. We've got a desire to go home and be with God. Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly uh, look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who when He comes, He'll change our lowly body into His glorious body. Friend, as we think about the things we can do after baptism, there's so many ways in which we can grow as a child of God. Are, are you growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Are we trying every day to have more love in our life? Are we striving to have the joy of Christianity? Do we have the, are we growing in the peace of God? Are we trying to do good to others? You know, as we think about things that I can do after baptism, here's one, I can help other people. I can do good unto all men especially the household of faith. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 10. The Bible commands in James 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to keep oneself unspotted from the world and to take care of or visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. I can help people, the poor, the needy, those who are hurting, those who have lost family members, those who are sick, those who are in need. I want to look for opportunities, now that I'm a child of God, to help other people. And I want to evangelize the lost and teach them about the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But you know, the main thing we want to emphasize is, don't think baptism is the end, okay? Baptism is not the, the period at the sentence. Baptism is the opening line in the novel that reads of our Christian life. And from this point forward, I've got to do my best to fill the pages of that with God's love, His mercy, His grace, the Christian fruits and attributes that I ought to have. And so baptism is not the ending point. It's not the period at the end of the sentence. Baptism is the starting point. We're now a new babe in Christ. We're now a, a new creature. I, think about this. I got a second chance. I got a do-over. I got a reboot. The slate has been wiped clean, and now I get to do it all over again. This time with Christ as my Lord and my Master. This time following the teaching of the Bible and doing my best not to live for sin and for Satan and for self, but to live for the Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Friend, as always, we want you to know today what God's plan of salvation clearly teaches. If you've heard these lessons concerning baptism, and maybe you've watched the whole series. If you haven't, you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and do that. But maybe you've seen or watched or heard this whole series of lessons, and you've never obeyed the gospel. Friend, we want you to know today that the one thing God wants you to do, and the one thing we want you to do, is respond in faith to the gospel plan of salvation. Friend, we ask you today to consider these things. Do you, are you willing to listen to what God has to say? If you say to yourself, well, sure, I want to hear what God says, and I want to submit to Him, then, friend, you're ready to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. If you've heard the message about Christ, we ask you today, do you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God? John 8, verse 24. If you believe that, then we follow up by asking you, are you willing to repent of sin? We're not saying you're going to be perfect. None of us are perfect. But are you willing to make a commitment? I'm going to do my best to turn from a life of sin, to not go down the path that I've gone before, and to live for Christ every day. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you, if you're willing to hear the Word of God, believe in Jesus and repent of your sins, would you confess Him as Savior? Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, if you're willing to do all that, would you be willing to do what the Bible says concerning baptism? Remember, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Remember, Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And Saul of Tarsus was told, and this is what we encourage you today, if you've never obeyed the gospel, here's the encouragement Ananias gave to Saul. Why don't you arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. Friend, if you've never done that, we want you to know today that God loves you, that we love you, and more than anything in all the world, God wants you to be saved, we want you to be saved, won't you submit to God and obey the gospel, and after that, be faithful until death. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. The Gospel of Christ.